so good to see all. Thank you. <laughs> it is so good to see all of you here, and I am so excited for the service we have planned today. Me too. My name is April. Actually, I'm on staff here. I'm our Wellspring Kids Director, and this is David Kelly. So I'm excited to be hosting with you today, David. Yes, this is the first time we've, we've ever hosted together. I think maybe And so. for those of you that do not know, I actually used to call her Miss April, and yeah. I still do this sometimes. This morning I said, you don't have to call me Miss April. <laughs> These people will call me April, but he's used to call me Miss April. But we're so glad to be doing this with you today and just welcoming everybody to our service. Um, if you are new to Wellspring and you haven't been coming for very long, we kind of want you to know that we are very passionate about students. Students, we pour into the next generation because we believe in their leadership, not only in our community, but also in the faith of um, our church and the next generation. And so David actually plays a big role in our kids' ministry on Sundays. He, he leads in our uh, fourth and fifth grade ministry. Oh, yeah, you. you can give him a, he's awesome. Uh, <laughs> a lot of other people back there better than like, me. Oh, so. stop, stop it. No, go on. Um, no. <laughs> so, but David wanted to share some exciting things that's happening in um, students this summer, right? Yeah, so this summer, we are going to our Wellspring Student Camp. Yeah, woo! Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think students could have made a little bit more noise than that, you know? We had to cancel last year due to the coronavirus, and so I'm just super stoked for what we are going to be doing this summer. It's July 12th through 16th, and the signups are up now. And for anyone that knows a student, uh, it's life-changing. Uh, both times I went, it completely opened up my eyes to so many different things, and I got closer to so many different people, including God. And not only that, but it is so much fun, so I feel bad for all you adults who aren't able to go. So <laughs> sign up for that. Sign up for up now, July 12th to 16th. It's, it's true. It's so fun. I get to go because I happen to be married to the student pastor. So yes. bonus. Bonus. Um, but I do not get to sleep. I don't get to do that. <laughs> but if you are joining us for the very first time, we are so glad that you're here this morning, whether you're watching online or you're joining us for the first time in the room. We would love to connect with you this morning. On the seat back in front of you, you'll actually, actually see a QR code. You can scan that QR code with your phone and find out all kinds of information about our church and also tell us a little bit about who you are. And we would love the chance just to get to know you a little bit this morning. We also have a blue tent right out front you might have seen when you come in. There's some people, a team of people there who would love the opportunity to meet you in person this morning. And if you are watching online, we want you to like and subscribe and follow us so that you don't miss a moment of what's happening here at Wellspring Church. Yes, and this series has been absolutely awesome. We are in so week good. three. Yeah. And so I don't wanna waste any more time. Everyone stand to your feet, wave to the person next to you, air high five because week three of Waymaker starts right now. Right now. Well, good morning. We are so excited to be able to worship with you this morning. We hope that you will join us. Sing as loud as you can. Clap your hands. Maybe even dance around a little bit, it's okay. We're gonna sing this out, come on. Every beat is calling, every beat is calling out your name, your name, your name. Come on. to life. Only you can, only you can. You set me free from every chain. You filled my heart with songs of praise. Only you can, only you can. Jesus, you're the only reason that I'm even breathing. I am wide awake.
calling out your name. Yeah. Better than 
Well, good morning. Have seats. Woo, that's right. Uh, if you're a guest today, my name's Trey. I am the pastor here. Thanks for joining us in the room. Thanks for joining us online. We're continuing a series today. We've been here for a couple weeks called Waymaker. And if today is your very first time joining us, either in room or online, I'm going to say something that if you come every week, you hear me say every week, but I say it because I always have new people. And so we have to remind them. If this is your first week, I'm going to highly encourage you, uh, download our app at some point this week. Uh, not only is it a great way to connect, but you can go back and you can watch weeks one and week two of this series. Because I've had a really good time uh, this last few weeks, and, and I hope if you've been around our church, you, you have as well. Because we're doing something pretty cool in this series. We're studying a group of people, specifically the nation of Israel, uh, at a very specific time in their lives. We're studying them as they pursue their promised land. And the reason we're studying them is because if you're here today and you consider yourself a Christian, you yourself are pursuing a promise of God. And if you're here today and you wouldn't even consider yourself a Christian, but you're kind of checking out the things of God, you are still here hoping to find proof of the promise that life is better with God. And so... We can study the nation of Israel as they pursued their promised land, and we can learn lessons from how, God, from, from how God worked and how God moved and how God provided in their situation. And the cool thing is, he's the same God that we're talking about here today. And so when we see how he moved thousands of years ago, we can learn how he might move now. And I know if you're here and you're, you're brand new, maybe you're not a Christian, you you're checking out things of God, but you wonder, like, okay, it's nice to hear about how God moves, but how's that relevant to me? How's, how's that going to affect my life? That's a, that's a really great question. And in fact, I'm, I'm glad you're here today if that is your question, because we've been basically looking at different episodes from the life of the nation of Israel as they travel to the promised land. And what we're going to see today, I think, might be the most relatable, the most relevant of all of the stories we're going to encounter. So rather than kind of set it up, what I want to do today is I want to jump right into the story. And then as we dive into the story, I think it's going to become pretty apparent to all of us how this affects us and why this should matter to all of us today. Whether we believe in God or maybe we're kind of checking out the things of God, it matters to all of us because we're all hopefully, if we're here, if we're at church, there's at least some hope that the promise of God might be true. And what we're going to learn today is going to make it easier for us to trust that truth, trust that reality, that in fact it is true. If you haven't been here the last couple of weeks, we began with the nation of Israel in captivity in Egypt. They were slaves, and we watched as God rescued them from Egypt and set them free and began them on their journey to the promised land. Last week, they encountered an obstacle. They encountered the Red Sea, and the Egyptian army was chasing them. But God put himself between them in danger, parted the Red Sea, and they crossed over on dry land. Because our God uses obstacles in our lives as opportunities to develop us and to strengthen us. And that's where we left them last week, and that's where we're going to pick up right now. They've just crossed the Red Sea, and this guy named Moses who was leading them, also the guy who recorded this history for us to read thousands of years later, he tells us that as soon as they crossed the Red Sea, they saw God do this amazing thing, their faith in God grew. That they had this massive faith. They believed in God. And, of course, who, who, who could blame them? I mean, if you saw God do something that tangible, like he parts the water, you're probably like, okay, yeah, I believe in you now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was really cool, man. And so what he tells us is after they cross the Red Sea, they have a celebration. They get all excited. They begin singing songs to God. They begin singing about the might of God. They begin singing about the power of God. And they're just all kind of wrapped up in this goodness of God. They're so excited. They're like... They're like football fans that won't leave the stadium after their team won a big game, like the national championship game, you know. I don't know personally what that feels like, but I can't wait till one day. But uh, other fans know what that feels like. But, you know, they, they just, they're, just, they're basically just chanting, God's number one, God's number one. Like they're just so excited because their God has come through in this massive, amazing way. They've never been more excited about God. And it's with this mindset that they set off on their journey to the promised land. And they set off through the desert to get to their promised land. And they go for an entire day with no food and no water. 
But they're like, you know what? Man, that God, he, he parted the Red Sea. He's good. No water, day one. They wake up day two. They walk all day, day two. No water. End of day two, they're like, okay. Getting a little thirsty. 48 hours in the desert without water. Not ideal. But God's still good. That's this God we just met. He's a, he's a good God. Okay. He'll, he'll, we'll see what happens tomorrow. Tomorrow they get up. Day three. Walking through the desert, no water. Finally, in the distance, they spot an oasis. So they get excited. Okay, finally. It's been three days. I need some water. They get to the water. They try to drink the water. Too bitter to drink. No water. Three days ago, they are singing the praises of their God. Three days later, when they see that water, this bitter they start to panic. The funny thing is, God actually tells Moses what to do, and go, Moses does something, and the water becomes drinkable, but it's too late. The nation of Israel begins to lose their minds. Here's what we're told happened. Then the whole community of Israel set out from Elam and journeyed into the wilderness of sin between Elam and Mount Sinai, you know, as, you, as one would do. Just going to Mount Sinai. They arrived there on the 15th day of the second month, one month after leaving the land of Egypt. One month they've been on this journey. Now, this is the journey from Egypt. So in that month's time was they went to the Red Sea. They'd seen the Red Sea parted. They've now been traveling at least three days, maybe more. They have no food. They have no water. The only water supply they, they, they have didn't work out well. So they are starting to panic And watch what they did. There, too, the whole community of Israel complained about Moses and Aaron. They began to complain. Now, go ahead and and tell you. We are not judging the nation of Israel today. We are learning from the nation of Israel today. Because who among us has not complained when a road trip took too long? (laughs) Who among us has not complained on a road trip when they didn't stop where we wanted to stop? has complained when you see the sign that says rest stop 100 miles ahead. And dad is like, we're not stopping. Because dad is racing someone in his mind to get to the destination. Who dad's racing? I don't know. What he thinks he's going to win? I don't know either. But I've raced that race a thousand times. And I don't understand why I do it. But I do. I'm trying to learn. So they begin to complain. They begin to panic. They attack Moses. They attack Aaron. They attack their leaders. Because it's been three days, no food, no water. And then they start to attack God. If only the Lord had killed us back in Egypt, they moaned. Because there we sat around pots filled with meat and ate all the bread we wanted. But now you've brought us into this wilderness to starve us all to death. Three days without water. And here's basically what they're saying. They believe that this new God that they've just met, that delivered them from Egypt, that parted the Red Sea, that that was all an elaborate trick. It was all an elaborate hoax to lure them out into the desert so he could kill them all. And they're simply saying, we'd rather you just killed us back in Egypt because we had food there. It was better there. That's where their thoughts go after three days with no water. Now, I hope you're not judging the nation of Israel because remember I said, this is the most relatable story we're going to talk about over this series. Because what was happening to the nation of Israel, I believe, is a universal human response. It's something we've all experienced, and it's something we will continue to experience unless we learn the lesson God wants for us today. Because here's what was happening to the nation of Israel, and here's what happens to us. When we lack provision, we lose perspective. That's all that happened. 
they began to feel lack in an area that they believed they deserved to have. They lacked food. They lacked water. We need water. And after three days, they lost all perspective and they began to panic. And we've all done the exact same thing. If you consider yourself a Christian today, I'm sure there's been times in your life where you have prayed for something relationally. You've prayed for something emotionally. You've prayed for an opportunity. Maybe you've prayed financially. And in that moment, it doesn't feel like God's providing. It doesn't feel like God's quite coming through. It doesn't feel like he's, he's, he's doing what we thought he would do, which basically means he's not doing what we want him to do. But it's into that moment when we feel ourselves lacking, we panic. Because we don't have perspective in that moment. So we question God, we doubt God, we, we doubt the goodness of God. I've done this in my life with, with, different, with relationships and opportunities. We've all done this. And it's not just Christians. This is a universal struggle. Think back to the nation of Israel. They began to long for their captivity. They began to long for what they had left behind. And we hear that and we think, who in the world would ever do that? Who would lose such perspective? The answer is every single one of us. Think about it. If you're old enough to have had more than one job, you've probably had a bad job. You probably had a job that you didn't like the boss, the hours were bad, and quitting that job was one of the greatest days of your life. You walked out of that job, I'm free. And then a month later, you didn't have a new job. And at some point before your new job clicked in, you began to lack. You didn't know if you had enough money. You began to doubt yourself. And you began to rethink that old job, didn't you? You began to think, maybe my boss wasn't that bad. You know, maybe the hours weren't that bad. Maybe it wasn't that old. Yes, it was worse than you remember. But when we lack provision, we lose perspective. And we begin to long for what we've left. How many of you ever had a dating relationship that got a little dysfunctional, a little toxic, and when you got out of it, you were real happy? Don't raise your hand. <laughs> but you know what happens? If you got out of that relationship and a month goes by, two months goes by, six months goes by, Maybe a year goes by and God hasn't provided that perfect spouse. What happens? You begin to long for what you left, don't you? You begin to rethink that relationship. You know what? Maybe, maybe he wasn't that bad. Maybe it wasn't that. Maybe, maybe she wasn't as bad as I remember. We begin to long for what we've left because we lack. We lack provision. And so we lose perspective. And that's why we talk ourselves into going back into bad habits, bad relationships, bad jobs. It's also how we justify bad behaviors. When we lack provision, we lose perspective. And that's when we begin to justify, you know what, it's probably okay if I cheat a little bit on this test. I've got to get this done because I've got to provide. You know, it's, it's probably okay if I just skim a little money off the top. Nobody's going to know, but I need it because I've got to provide. See, that's what happens. When we lack provision long enough, emotionally, relationally, financially, we lose perspective and we begin to convince ourselves, I've got to provide because no one else is going to do it. No one else has, no one else will, will. So anything I have to do to provide is justified in this moment. And we think that because we lack perspective. We basically all become two-year-olds who haven't eaten in two hours and who are starving. They're starving because they're two. And they haven't learned, I'm probably going to eat again pretty soon. They still wonder, I may never eat again. And so they scream until you feed them. And then when they get hungry, they scream until you, because they don't have the perspective yet. And so they behave irrationally. See, the reason I don't judge the nation of Israel is because they, don't, they didn't have this perspective yet. 
God was the God of their ancestors, but the vast majority of the nation of Israel, they had known this God maybe two months. He had shown up and he had said, hey, I'm your God, let's go. And he had done some cool things, but they didn't know him personally. And every other God they had ever heard of, the Egyptian gods, were the exact kind of God that would lure people out into the desert to kill them. That was what they were familiar with. That was their understanding of of a God. And so to understand the one true God, they, they didn't have the perspective yet. And so God decides to give them perspective. He provides for them. And what I want us to do today is I want us to learn from the manner in which God provided to them. What I want us to all hopefully gain today is a little provision perspective. Because as we see how God provides for the nation of Israel, there are some principles we can take from that provision and know, hey, he's going to provide for us the same way. And as we understand those principles, there's going to be some questions that we learn that we can ask ourselves in the midst of the lack, in the midst of the panic, in the midst of the losing of that perspective. We can ask these questions to refocus our attention on the God of the universe. And so I just want to quickly walk through how God provided in this moment for the nation of Israel. And as I do, I want to hopefully provide me and you and all of us some provision perspective And hopefully we can all walk away understanding one fundamental truth. And it's this. God provides. He does. Our God perfectly provides. Always. He's never let me down once and he never will. In my life, I kind of have a saying. If I don't have it, I didn't need it. Because God's not always going to provide what I want. But God provides what we need. He loves us. And he provides for us. And he provided for the nation of Israel. In fact, after this moment, after their complaint, this is what God says. Lord said to Moses, look, I'm going to rain down food from heaven for you. He's like, oh, you're hungry? You want some food? I'm going to rain food down from heaven. Heaven. In other words, I'm going to provide for you in a way that makes it abundantly clear I'm the one who provided. See, this is the first perspective shift that I believe we need to make when it comes to God's provision, and it's this. God's provision is always personal. God is always going to provide in a way that draws us into a relationship with him. He is always going to do it in a way that, that, that causes us to rely on him more and to trust him more. More. Let's, let's look at what, they, what he said again. So he said, I'm going to rain down food from heaven for you. In other words, I'm going to provide it. But watch how he provides it. He says, each day the people can go out and pick up as much food as they need for that day. He says, I'm going to provide a day supply each day. Each day I want you to get up. I want you to think about me. I want you to go out and I want you to understand I provided for you. I want you to trust me each day that I'm going to provide. See, I'm sure the nation of Israel was like, hey, God, I'd much rather have a year's supply of food. Can you just give me a year's supply? Then I, that way I can pack it up. I can, have, you know, I can have my safety net and I can have all these things. I don't really want a daily supply. I want a yearly supply. And God's like, I know, but if I gave you a yearly supply, you talk to me again in a year. Which is why when Jesus was on the earth, and he was teaching his disciples and us how to pray. He said to pray and ask our Heavenly Father for our daily bread. Not our weekly bread, not our monthly bread, daily bread. Because God is always going to provide in a way that strengthens a relationship, that increases our reliance on him. How do I know? Because his provision is personal. He's always going to provide personally for us, which means when we find ourselves in a position of lack, when we find ourselves beginning to panic, when we find ourselves beginning to doubt God, when we lose perspective of who God is, there's a clarifying question I can ask and you can ask and we can all ask to hopefully give us some perspective in that moment. And it's this question. is: Am I looking to God for provision? Or am I looking around? 
Am I looking at myself? Am I looking at my boss? Am I looking at my coworkers? Am I looking at other people? Or am I actually looking to God to provide? Have I even asked God if he wanted to provide? Or have I already decided he doesn't? Have I just decided God brought me out into the desert to kill me? The way we get past that doubt and past that question is we turn to God. And we look and say, hey, God, are you going to provide for me here? Because I'm looking at you. Waiting for you to provide. And God says, I'll provide. And that's exactly what he did with the nation of Israel. So the first question we can ask is, hey, am I looking to God for provision? But that's not the only question. Because we can look to God all day long and still sometimes miss the manner in which he's trying to provide. And that's the second perspective shift I think we need to make. See, sometimes his provision will require our participation. It often requires, I don't say always, sometimes God just, you know, like rains down on you, you know, but that's not typically how God provides. God typically provides the resources, but he expects us to do the work. That's what he did for the nation of Israel. God sent them food in two ways. He sent them every morning something called manna, and every evening he sent them quails. Now, manna was literally this unknown substance that they'd never seen before. It would appear on the ground as the dew dried every morning. And it was this flaky substance that could be harvested, and then it could be ground up into flour, then it could be baked into bread, and it produced a very sweet-tasting bread. And the quail, obviously, were live quail. God didn't door dash them a meal. <laughs> you know, God gave them the ingredients to the meal, but they had to get up every morning and harvest the manna. They had to make the flour. They had to bake the bread. They had to go and they had to catch the birds. They had to clean the birds. They had to cook the birds. Sometimes we don't think God's providing because we're just sitting here waiting. And God's saying, I told you what to do. Do that. Because see, here's the reality. If God's told us to do something, he's not going to move until we do it. Because the relationship is the primary thing, and he wants us to learn to trust him. He wants us to learn to talk to him. And so sometimes we're just busy sitting around waiting for God to provide, and God's like, I, I, I provided. Whenever you're ready to take that step, go ahead. You're going to step into your provision, but... This is where I stop and I wait. Which means there's a question that we can ask ourselves when we feel like things are lacking, when we feel like we lack provision, when we look around, we don't have perspective. There's a question we can ask, and it's this. Hey, is there a step God is asking me to take? And if the answer is yes, take it. Step into it. Because it is as we step with God, as we participate with God, that we learn to trust God better. It's like when you were a little kid, and maybe you'd go to your, your grandma's house, and like, you know, she'd cook. And when you were a real little kid, if you'd say, hey, I want to help, Grandma, you didn't help, you watched. But as you got older, she would actually invite you in, right? You can stir this. You can do this. And it was as you participated in it that you began to understand better what was happening. Oh, that's why you do. Oh, that's why. That, that makes sense. It's the same thing with God. He's trying to grow the relationship. Yes, we all wish God would just leave a briefcase full of cash on the front door and it says, love God. <laughs> right? That'd be great. But that's just, that's not the way our God works. He works relationally. He invites us in. But you have to be careful about taking steps to achieve provision. You have to make sure you're taking God's step. Because sometimes when we lack, sometimes when we feel like no one's going to help us, sometimes when we feel like it's all on us, we can take steps that lead us away from God in the name of providing. I said it before. It's easy to justify in the moment When we can't pay the bills at home, you know what? Nobody's going to miss this money. My boss is rich. This is how I have to provide. See, we justify it. 
We do things we would never do when we weren't in lack. And it's because we don't have perspective in that moment. And so we panic. Which is why there's a third clarifying principle about God's provision. And it's this. His provision is pure. Which means God is always and only going to provide in a manner that is consistent with his word and with his character. In other words, if you have to sin to provide, that ain't God's provision. That's the South Carolina version of that statement. And this is something I struggle with and you struggle with and we all struggle with. It's something the nation of Israel struggled with as well. Even as God was giving them these provision rules, they struggled and they wanted to provide for themselves in their own way. Two, two main areas. You may remember when we read the verse about God raining down food, he said, I want you to collect enough food for what you need each day. In other words, don't get extra. No extra. Take what you need and trust that it will be there tomorrow. Well, some of the nation of Israel didn't listen to that. And at the beginning of the process, they would collect more than they needed. And they would store some in the back so they had extra for tomorrow. And every morning they'd wake up and the extra would be rotten. And the entire tent would be filled with the foul odor of the rotten manna. So not only did it not work, it actually made the situation worse. Which is what always happens when we try to take provision into our own hands. And when we step in a way that God says, no, 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 don't go that way. Don't go that way because never, ever, ever is he going to provide in a way that is inconsistent with his word and is inconsistent with his character. That's just not who God is. That's just not what God's going to do. The second time this happened was God decided to give the nation of Israel a gift as they were out here in the desert. They had been, they had been traveling. They had been, they had been working hard, and God loves his people. And so he gave them something called the Sabbath, which was a day off. He's like, hey, you're going to work six days a week. We're going to travel six days a week. On the seventh day, I want you to rest. I don't want you to do any work at all. And that included collecting resources. So what God said is, hey, every day go out and get as much as you need. But on the sixth day, on the day before the Sabbath day, on the day before your day off, I want you to go out and get double. Go out and get double the, double the manna, double the quail, double, and I promise, they'll preserve every night. They'll be perfect because there will be no food on the seventh day. There will be no provision on the seventh day because it's a day of rest. But wouldn't you know it, many people on the seventh day still got up, left their tent looking for food. And here's what Moses told us. Some of the people went out anyway on the seventh day, but they found no food. They went looking where God had said don't look. And they found nothing, which of course they found nothing because God's always going to provide in a manner that is consistent with his word and it's consistent with his character. But see, there's something else that's scary that can happen if you go looking for God's provision where he's told you it won't be. If you go looking for it and it's not there, you can begin to doubt God. Like I wonder on the seventh day if people would got out, leave the, leave, leave the tent, look for food and say, I knew he'd let me down today. I knew he wouldn't be out there today. And it's like, he told you he wasn't providing for you today. He gave you extra yesterday. He gave you double because he wasn't going to be there. But we do the very same thing. We pursue our own provision. And then when it doesn't work out, we blame God for it. God's like, I told you not to do that. Well, you should have stopped me. He's like, I tried. I sent three friends to have conversations with you about it, and you ignored all of them. Well, this is what happens. When we lack provision, we lose perspective. And we panic and we take matters into our own hands. And sometimes we step outside of where God wants us to go. And it doesn't work out for any of us. Which is why we need to remember that his provision is pure. It's always going to be consistent, which means there's a question we can ask to help clarify that in our minds as we're seeking his provision in any situation, and it's this. Hey, am I pursuing God's provision or my own? Am I pursuing what God wants for my life, or have I left God and I've just decided to justify some behaviors? We've all done it. The nation of Israel did it. This is a judgment-free zone. This is purely about gaining perspective. In places where we've missed it, where you've missed it, where we've all missed it. 
And it's about taking those previous experiences and preparing to move forward and not make the same ones again. But let's be honest. We've heard a couple of principles. We've got a couple of questions. But if you currently find yourself in lack, if you currently find yourself and you feel like you're missing out emotionally, relationally, financially, all the questions in the world can't really bring the perspective you need. All the principles in the world can't really get you where you need to go. And God understood that. Which is why God gave the nation of Israel one more command about his provision. Here's what he said. He said, this is what the Lord has commanded. He said, I want you to fill a two-quart container with manna to preserve it for your descendants. Then later generations will be able to see the food I gave you in the wilderness when I set you free from Egypt. He said, hey, guys, you were lacking. You panicked. I provided, and I'm going to keep providing. But here's what I need you to do. I need you to preserve some proof of my provision. I need you to put some away for yourself for future generations, because you're going to lack again. You're going to panic again. You're going to have moments where you don't see my provision again. But next time, I want you to have something tangible. I want you to have something real. I want you to have proof in your hand. I want you to have proof that can help provide perspective. So preserve some of the manna. Preserve some of the provision. Put it away. Talk about it. Explain it to your kids. Which means there's a question we can all ask ourselves about God's provision, and it's this. Hey, am I preserving the proof of God's provision? Now, if you consider yourself a Christian, the answer is should be, but we probably don't. Right? We pray, we pray, we pray. God provides. We say, sweet, and we move on to the next thing we need God to provide for. What would happen if you paused? And preserved. Write it down. Share it on social media. The internet's written in pen. Let's fill it with good stuff from God, right? Now, maybe you're here today and you say, I I don't believe in God. I'm not sure about this God thing. How am I going to preserve proof? I understand that, but think back on your life. Have there not been moments? Have there not been times? Have there not been seasons where you're like, man, I don't know how this worked out? It felt like the greatest coincidence of all time. Or maybe even then you had the thought, man, was that, was that God looking out for me? Was that God protecting me? Yes. Because he loves you and he is constantly trying to draw you in to a relationship. But if we take the time to properly preserve the proof of God's provision we then have something that can overpower the panic. So here's my challenge and we're done. Spend some time today. Spend some time this week, either alone or talking with a friend, talking with your kids, talking with your spouse, and spend some time reflecting on God's provision. Just spend some time thinking about the times you know beyond a shadow of a doubt in the past, God provided. God came through. God delivered. And then preserve it. Write it down. I'm not kidding. Share it on social media. Put it somewhere to prepare yourselves for the next time you panic because it's coming. You may be panicking right now. And maybe the way you're going to get out of the current panic is to remember the previous provision. Because he's the same God yesterday, today, and forever. And you may say, I have no proof of provision. Well, I got good news for you. There's this book called the Bible. It is full of stories of God providing. And every single one of them is true. And you can read them, and you can see how God moved then, and you can be assured that he will move the same way in your life. Because here's the reality. Here's the promise. Here's the truth about following God. God provides. He's batting a thousand. He's never let his people down. And if you spend some time this week reflecting, God will bring to mind moments of provision in your life. And if you take the time to record them, if you take the time to preserve them, you will be preparing your mind to have the proper perspective the next time you panic. Just imagine, imagine being prepared The next time you lack. 
And instead of turning and thinking that God brought you out in the desert to kill you or that God's let you down, imagine having the peace of pulling out some proof. Hey, man, I remember how I felt when this happened. Whew. And God, I remember what you did. And so, God, I'm not going to panic this time because you're good. And because you provided before, and so I know you'll provide again. Imagine the difference that will make in the lives of your kids. Imagine the difference that will make in the lives of your friends and your family and your neighbors and your coworkers. Imagine having the faith and the confidence to walk into lack knowing God's going to provide. I don't know how. I don't know when. I don't know what he's going to ask me to do. But I know he's going to provide. That's what's available for us today. Proof when we panic. And that proof is what can turn our panic into praise. As we let our perspective be shaped by a God who perfectly provides. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you so much. Uh, God, we're just so thankful for your son. We're so thankful for the simple truth of your word. Father, fill our hearts with the fact that you provide. Father, we thank you for grace when we panic. We thank you for grace when we lose perspective. And we thank you for these stories that we can trust and the word to me. we know to be true. Father, I pray this week that you bring to mind moments of provision in our life. Give us the ability to preserve them so that we have the proof the next time we panic. We love you. We are so thankful that you love us. We're so thankful for your son. And everything we pray is in his amazing holy name. Amen. This message that we just heard from Trey this morning is so personal to me because of how I've seen God provide in my life. Sometimes I think maybe that God's provision has been the theme of my own growth in my relationship with God and how I've seen him work in my life and how he has, as Trey said, drawn me into relationship and to closeness with him. And so I love that we take a moment every week to celebrate this in our service. You know, if you have seen God provide in your own life, we get pretty excited about it because sometimes there is just no mistaking that the provision that we've seen in our life is from anyone but God. And so that's why we get so excited to celebrate this moment together as a church. Wellspring, it's time to give our offering. We believe that everything that we have comes from God. And so just like with the Israelites, we know, as Trey said, that our God's um, provision requires our participation. And so God asks for our obedience. He asks that we return 10% to him of everything that he gives us. Every part of our income, we, we, we give back to him 10% of that, which isn't a lot, but it's an act of obedience. And every time we give back to God, we're saying, God, I trust you to provide. We are showing God that we trust his provision in our life every time we give back to him. And it's our hope and our prayer that as you give back to him, that you will have the perspective to see the proof of God's provision in your life, that you will see how he is taking care of your daily needs, that you will look around you and that you will see how God is taking care of you and providing in your life and not just in your own life, but that you will be aware of the stories and the life change that's happening right here in this church because of your giving and that God is using you to provide life change and to make um, making his name known to other people and that they are beginning to experience God's provision as well. And we wanna say thank you for that. Thank you for your, your obedience. Thank you for your commitment. We pray and we hope that you will continue to see God's provision in your life and we believe that you will. Let's pray together. God, you are our provider. Thank you for all of the good things that you've given us. There is no mistaking where our blessing and our goodness comes from, God. 
Thank you of how, for how you provide exactly what we need, our daily bread. God, as we give back this morning, we are declaring that we trust you to continue to do so. We trust your perfect provision. We trust your timing. We trust your goodness and that you know exactly what we need and when we need it. God, I pray that you would just take all of these offerings that we give back to you and that you would just continue to show us how good you are, that you would do more than we could ever possibly dream or imagine and that there would be no mistaking of who you are through the way that you provide and through the work that you're doing, not only in our lives, but in the lives of others. Thank you that we get to be a part of it. We love you so much, God. In your name that we pray, amen. We're getting ready to sing one more song, so you guys stand with us.
just want everybody to just think about what God has done in your lives, the battles that he has fought and won. Think about that and, and what he's brought you through, the things that the enemy meant for evil that he turned to good. And we know that those things will remind us as we go through times of trouble, when we go through times where we don't know what to do, to remind us we've seen him do it and we know he's gonna do it again. Let's just take this time to, to lift our hearts and our hands to him. Let's just, just thank him for his love and his mercy and his grace. Let's thank him for what he's done in our lives. Shout to God, come on. We will see you next Sunday. Have a great